السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I wish you peace and uh, safety and uh, healthy life to you and to every one of you. Uh, wherever you are, whenever you are in this planet, inshallah, at this very difficult time that humanity is facing, especially in the Middle, <coughs> the Middle East and uh, <coughs> other countries as well. Today, the title is funny, as you understand from this, what, is, what I'm going to talk about necktie, as you can see it here. <coughs> it happens because a week ago, I was in Doha, visiting some organization and some friends there, and I met with this gentleman, Mr. Muhammad Al-Amin, who was working, who was working as, <coughs> uh, in, in Qatar charity, as an uh, economic <coughs> empowerment manager. There, and we're discussing the issue of economic empowerment. In this room, <coughs> were three of us. Muhammad Amin is from Mauritania. Sayyidi Abd Rabbi Ibn Sahra from uh, Morocco. And myself, originally from Egypt. It's very difficult when you sit down in a room having two individuals, one of them is from Mauritania, the land of the authentic Arabic spoken and written language. With it is metaphor and its beauty and diversity. The second one is from Morocco, Abd Rabbi in the Sahara, which is a country of philosophy. You know the Andalusian style and the big culture of philosophy there and Ibn Khaldun and the others. So when you sit down among these two giants from these two countries, you have to feel that you are a dwarf. Then I looked at his tie, which you can see it here. Okay? And I liked it very much. And we called it, as Abd Rabbi said, from the necktie revelation. The discussion went on and on and on on the basis of education. That's why some of you might say, what, is, what are we going to listen to, the, to, to, to today? It's education. And it went with all these points in front of us, given to me, inspired to me by Abd Rabbi, as well as uh, Muhammad Amin. What happened to our education system? Yesterday I spoke about it in Arabic, especially for the Middle East, for Egypt and others. Today we're speaking about it in English to the people who are not Arabic speaking, particularly from the Indian subcontinent. And maybe the communities are living in the West as well. Why we are at the bottom of the list in our countries, okay, and globally? You find country X and Y and Z and whatever it is, it's at the bottom of the education system. Because we change our education system without proper planning. We used to have a proper education system based on Khalawi, like in Africa, Zawaya, like in Africa as well, Madrasa, like in Indian subcontinent, Katatib, like in Africa and Egypt and others, and all of a sudden, 100 to 200 years ago, we decided to change the system and get the civil system or the modern system and introduced the modern subject. Why I'm talking about the system in the good old days? I was in Libya, and they were talking about uh, the two months ago, in December, before Christmas, and they were discussing the impact of Zawiya on the lifestyle and on the education and on the culture and on the loyalty to the individual who is learning in the Zawiya to defend his or her own country while the colonialists were coming to attack such countries. So if you want to change the system, we have 
to understand the culture of the local, the local culture, the history of the people, the language of the people, okay, the values of the people and the religion of the people. In the these countries, whether in Africa or Middle East or in sub Indian in Indian subcontinent, there was a new phenomena coming to these countries through the colonial lists or to clon the colonial regime by actually introducing the church schools at the time, which was high class, teaching different language, different culture, and different, 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 different. Came there. And unfortunately, at that time, the state which was running this country, or the, the, the government, went straight without planning to change the system, without having any proper plan for it. Changing the educational curriculum. Every other year, nowadays or before, you get a minister of education in a certain country who is adding something to the curriculum, removing something from the curriculum, politically driven by his own or her own political party. Also, this is affecting the social fabric of the society. Because if you want to introduce any new subject to the curriculum, it has to be accepted by the community. It has to be relevant to the culture of the community. It has not to be antagonizing the value of the local, the local values of the community. And it has not to be hitting the pillars of the religion of such community. Changing the curriculum. Okay. And even the methodology of teaching. What do you mean by methodology of teaching? I'm not a specialist in education, as you understand. But methodology of teaching means that when you remember the Khalawi style or the Zawiya style, one of the most important things is the openness. Okay? It's the close relationship with the local teacher, who was not only a teacher, but a teacher and the murabbi. Murabbi and ask somebody who educate you the eti- who teach you the etiquette and the morality and the reality to the country. Somebody like a, become a role model. And this was a great example. That's why they started the Azhar University more than 1,000 years ago. Based on the freedom of the student to learn at the time he likes, from the teaching he likes, huh? and the subject he likes. And they call it Sheikh Amud, the Sheikh of the pillar. Amud in Arabic means the pillar. So each student at Al Azhar University at that time was free to take the subject he likes at the time for Fajr or the early morning after sunrise or before sunrise or midday or late afternoon or sunset or evening and in front of him may be about 20 or 30 specialists in different subjects in Sharia, in Arabic language in Fiqh in history, in literacy in poetry in uh, uh, Usul okay, in Sira, in Hadith and the others so this kind of freedom given to the young man at Al-Azhar, a young student at Al-Azhar at that time, give him the wealth of knowledge and the diversity that he can learn from anybody and everybody. At the same time, this kind of free space or big space for the, for the young student is to grasp the knowledge from those role models who are teachers or professors or as we call them, Sheikh Amud. This is the methodology which was there in the madrasa, was there in the Zawiya, was there in Al-Azhar, was there actually in the Kutab itself. Okay? So we keep changing things without knowing the outcome or the output of our change with a methodology or curriculum or system. Introducing different type of education, as I said, from this open space education, which I saw in Africa, still happening nowadays, under the tree, I saw it in Kashmir and Pakistan still happening nowadays because there's no 
facilities to build uh, uh, school rooms to these tight rooms. From the open space to the tight rooms. Okay? And this different education, when we put a system to separate class 1 from class 2, from class 3, from class 4, and so on, so on, so on. And we departmentalize all the children in a box to learn. Sometimes with lack of communication with other children. And there was competition happening now between the modern education, which is introduced by the uh, 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 church schools who came to these countries hundreds of, years, hundreds of years ago, and the traditional education, which come from Zawiya, Madrasa, Katatib, and, 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 Katatib, and uh, Khalawi, uh, etc. So, once you make two state systems, you have two society. You have different cultures. You have different methodology of thinking. You have different clarity. You have different values. You have different values, which this is what's happening when you introduce things to a society which was there, so you start dividing the society to it. And this actually affects the acquisition, as I mentioned about the acquisition of knowledge, of education and knowledge from actually the free thinking to go to the, to the, to the teacher they like, to lock them in a room and without, have any, without having any imagination or uh, innovation. Recently it happened in the Middle East that dividing the school, the, 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 the school education into the scientific and the humanity subject or science and the humanity subject. In the Indian subcontinent and in, uh, uh, in North Africa and in Africa as I mentioned yesterday, people value more the doctors, medical doctors, dentists, engineers, to the people who study history, the people who study uh, uh, literature or literacy or science of humanity science. Even the dream of the young girls who have been brainwashed by the media, I'd love to say what? Each girl would love to marry a doctor or a dentist or an engineer. Does not want to, 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 to marry a teacher or a lawyer or uh, 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 what do you call it, a uh, uh, poet. Okay? No. This is where started to deeply divide the community through the education which divide the education system in two parts. Part is studying the science subjects which go to the uh, colleges and the universities to teach, uh, learn medicine and uh, engineering, science, and the other part which is studying the science of humanity. Okay? Education, period of education. Does it have to be one size fits all? Maybe in one country you might need 15 years. In another country you might need 5 years. In another third country you might need 10 years. Why should we all go the same system? In certain countries, actually in, in the developing countries, they are discussing the, 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 the period or the, of, uh, whether the primary education should be 5 years or 6 years or 4 years. Whether you have the kindergarten before, or no kindergarten, or you have and all these kind of things, you have to make it suitable to your society. Not because it's good in America, it has to be good in, in Africa. Not because it's excellent in Japan, it has to be excellent in India. No. Every one of us has to accommodate the length of the period of the education to the need of the society. I give the example here about what's happening in the conflict zones. Especially in the case of Syria or Yemen or whatever it is now. Take Syria as a classical example. People are putting a, a, a curriculum and uh, 
period of education as if they are living in a stable state. Which is wrong. In, 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 in societies like this, we have to look and to prioritize the vocational training and the skills training. Short courses to enable the young boys and girls to become breadwinner for the family after they finish the primary education. I found some people are very fond of giving them tablets, giving them this and that, and they think that they are living in the middle of a very stable state. The proper budget, proper curriculum, proper education system, which is wrong. So we have, we cannot have something called one size fits all for every country, even if all the countries are stable and safe and sound. We started to value the foreign languages to our local language. The new subject which is being taught in different countries to our subjects, which we need it most. We might say, yes, we agree, but at the end of the day, what we need to say, does this fit our society? Are these subjects needed by our society or we are like blindfolded following another blind people? Don't give in and so your inferiority complex towards an advanced country which you have not seen it, we have not seen it when it was building it is society inside from scratch. Well, in, in the case of America, when the immigrant went from Europe to America to start from scratch, they want the upheaval, very difficult, to climb it to become America in 200 years plus. Or after the Second World War, or the First World War in Europe, when you found that the war destroyed total destruction of cities, towns, and countries, and they start from scratch again. Gradually, progressively, and steady. We are still ignoring, up till now, the vocational education, the skills education, which is the basic of any economy the skillful worker, the manual work, the people who manufactures, the people, the workers who manufactures, the workers who paint, build, make the handcraft, weave, plant, clean, construct, repair. Even our, uh, in this kind of vocational training which is here, Ignoring it, girls don't want to get anybody who is not qualified to, to marry anybody who is not qualified from university, does not have a PhD or master or whatever it is. If somebody has got high skilled profession and have good income, still some of the girls in some countries do not want to marry him because he is not qualified from university. And this is the inferiority complex to the education system. We ignored in our countries, okay, especially in uh, these countries or developing or rising countries, the relationship between the market and the education system itself. We have to produce the skilled, educated individuals who the market needs them. What is the point of getting people who have got PhD but I don't need PhD people? I don't need people who master. I mean, I mean, I need skillful people at this stage to rebuild Syria, to rebuild Yemen, to rebuild Libya, to rebuild any other country, Iraq and others, as well as even actually to expand the industry in India and China and others. It's not only people sitting on desk with a degree. It's people who are actually building the economy from bottom up and people that the market needs them as well. Plumbers, electrician, mechanics, uh, technician, and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. 
When we look at this country, what a country which is actually uh, 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 the developing, so-called developing or third world countries, what is the percentage in the budget for education? Is it one percent? Is it two percent? Is it five percent? Is it ten percent? Is it fifty percent? What what do you want from education? If the government spend cross cutting. More than 40 to 50 to 60 percent of its budget on military and security, and the rest on the rest of the social services delivered to the people. When we look at the school resources, okay, the salaries of the teachers, the playground. The science lab, the journeys and travels, outing for the child and the, uh, the children to go out. The other facilities in the room, in the class, the size of the class, the number of the pupils in the class, the atmosphere in the class. It's not there. Because we don't value education. We don't value education. We don't value education. Education and knowledge build the waterproof security system in any society. Get an uneducated, ignorant child, you lose the independence and sovereignty of your country. Get a highly qualified PhD individual who is not very well educated and getting the right knowledge to love his country and the values of the country and the morality of the countries, you get your country brought down to the bottom of the list of the advancing countries. So look at the salaries, look at the facilities in the school, where it is. Even it's affecting the West now. Cuts, 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 cuts. Cuts is for what? For security. Cuts is for what? For intelligence. Cuts is for what? For military. So we get people who are not highly educated. They learn the subjects, but they are not very well educated in the system. Okay, the respect to science, scientists, and knowledgeable people. Look at who is the top star of the country, any country, without being critical to them. It's not a scientist. It's not an engineer. It's not a doctor who discovered something. It is somebody else, without mentioning the names of the profession, because I'm not against any. Could be a footballer who earned two, three hundred, who has been bought or sold by two or three hundred million dollars or euro, and earn maybe hundred thousand or two hundred thousand a week. While a professor in the university, his salary is cannot become hundred thousand pound a year. Look at the movie stars; we respect them all the way. They earn the millions and millions and millions, but those people who are in the science lab, who are making the law for us, who are protecting us, getting the peanuts. That's why we are not having justice to the role models that we have. Prioritizing uh, respect uh, to the science, technology, and so on, so on, so on. Prioritizing the foreign languages. I mentioned it earlier at the school. When Abd Rabbi and uh, Muhammad Amin were discussing it with myself, he, Abd Rabbi told me, when the foreign language schools have been brought to our countries at that time, it created different societies. Each society has a different culture. Each society has a different methodology of life. Each society has different values of moralities. Okay? Inside 
the greater society. So you need to bridge the gap between the French speaking, the English speaking, the German speaking, the Arabic speaking, and so on, so on, so on, so on. So on. Because it's not just a language. It's a culture. It's values. It's etiquette. It's history. It's, it's role modeling. And so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. And when we make a comparison, especially for the Arabs, as I mentioned it yesterday, and when I was talking yesterday, I mentioned the difference between the richness of different languages. We found that people who are Arab have got a very, very rich language, but they ignore it because they are ignorant. They don't know the value of their language. The language is about 8,000 years old. The language has got the most uh, letters, 28 letters, compared to the Hebrew, which is 19, compared to the English, which is 26. The language has got 16,000 roots, compared to the Hebrew, is about 2,500 roots, to the Latin, which is about 700 roots. The most spoken language nowadays on earth is the English language. We agree. And we want all our children to speak English, to speak French, to speak German, to speak Spanish, to speak Portuguese, to speak Chinese, to speak Japanese, to speak Arab. But why do you speak your master language? Why? Because we discovered that the subject inside the Arabic language could be up to 80,000. The second best is the English language. is 42,000. Because the English language is made out, out of quite a few languages like Germanic, like Latin, like Celtic, like French. The creation of the English language as a language did not start 8,000 years ago. There are many, many discussions about different periods to collect the language and make it a proper language for either from the 6th century or 7th century, but probably from 13th or 14th century. Somebody says 12, somebody says 13, somebody says 14. And to the protection or to the astonishment, we look at, I looked at four languages. Actually, to see the number of words, spoken words of these four languages. I found that the Russian have got in the dictionary 130,000 words. The French, which was the language, which is the language of the aristocrat, of the top class, 150,000 words is the vocabulary. The English is 600,000 words. As I said before, because it's combination, you find this, the roots of the language goes to the French, it goes to the Latin, go to the Germanic, go to uh, uh, the Celtic, and so on, so on, so on, so on. And they keep developing it. But the Arabic language has one, has 12.3 million words. Because it has something called derivatives of every word. Like word X, I've got maybe 10 derivatives or more. And this is what we call it in Arabic. Ism al-fa'il, ism al-maf'ul, sighat al-mubalgha, as-sifar al-mushabbaha, ism al-tafdeel, ism al-zaman, ism al-makan, ism al-alim. Because of this richness of this language. I'm not against learning any other language. Learn as much as you want. But see the richest language, stick to it, and learn other languages as well. Coming back to conclusion, we say... Why we talk today about this revelation, which is called necktie revelation, is because we need to reform our education system. We need to reform our way of thinking. When we make a change, we have to make a plan. We need to know that the best investment is the investment in the human being. Human being like Muhammad Amin. The children to go, to grow. We need to respect our values, our history, our language, huh? our culture. We need not to feel that we are inferior to anybody else. 
We need to develop our education system to get the subject that actually we learn to serve the community that we live in. We need to be what we are. To look to ourselves as what we are, not to look ourselves to, look, to find somebody else. No, this is not right. So come back to realize that we are different to others, but we can compete with others. We can be ahead of others. When we understand the needs of our society, when we respect science and technology, when we respect our culture, our history, our language, our morality, when we invest in education, when we invest in the citizen himself or herself, not in bricks and walls and land and building. Some of those countries who invest in buildings have got consumer citizens, not producing citizens, not effective citizens, not pioneering citizens, not leading citizens. No matter how much they give them money and salaries and allowances every month or every week or every year to seduce their thinking and to slow their thinking. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.